Good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about this Genix here, and namely today, uh, getting in detail into our cells, the science, and, and really talking about the application. Um, there's a number of us working on this particular space, and uh, we want to share some unique science and also provide some updates on where we're at. We are a biotech company. We're located out of Salt Lake City and Research Park, and we're focused strictly on spinal therapeutics to treat patients with degenerative disc disease. Before we get into uh, more detail on degenerative discs, a um, couple facts. One, um, nearly 60% of uh, people age 70 will have degenerative disc disease. It's the leading cause of low back pain, and also it represents about a $100 billion spend in the U.S. when you look at cost of care treatment, as well as impacts on productivity out there. So it's significant dis disease state. Um, there's three columns of images here. The first one is really gross morphology or histology images. And if you look at the top and work your way to the bottom, it shows a cascade of a generation. So you see on the left a normal healthy disc. You have the nucleus is, is solid and, and white, uh, very healthy looking. And as you progress with different stages of degenerative disc disease, the extracellular matrix within the disc nucleus begins to break down. Um, other manifestations, if you look at it through what the clinicians would see, uh, one would be x-rays or radiograph images where you see a normal disc has a, a maintained uh, disc space, and then as the uh, breakdown occurs, you'll see a lowering occurring of that disc space, a narrowing in there. On MRI, you'll see uh, going from a healthy, hydrated disc that shows up in the T2 weight images to really a start of a degradation where you'll lose image density uh, within the nucleus, you'll see a collapse. You'll also see bulging going on of the annulus that will lead ultimately in late stage to a totally collapsed disc. So what causes this? Several things. One is inflammation. Uh, cytokine changes can happen that can ch trigger pain within the existing nerves. Uh, more commonly is a breakdown of the extracellular matrix. If you've seen some of these images where it will begin to break down and abnormal uh, motion will start to occur or micro motion within this particular motion segment with bulging that can press on surrounding nerve roots or the canal uh, being a, lead, a leading cause of pain within that. And at that point when that occurs with near nerve impingement, uh, spinal fusion is often warranted late stage. Other things that can happen is with these cracks and fissures in the annulus, innervation or where small nerves can enter and cause external pain within the disc, and place calcification, you can see a change in the actual phenotype of the cells within the nucleus, and then certainly cell senescence. We, we can effectively auto-repair our cells in these latter stages of degenerative disc disease. So why, why do we need a cell therapy? Um, there are several things a cell can do depending on its type, and one is to provide new paracrine signals where you can normalize or control this inflammation process that's taking place within the disc or this innervation. So as these new cells can act to reduce the pain, these classic anti-inflammatory characteristics of a stem cell, or can slow down this feedback loop of the catabolism that's taking place. You can impact the native cells that can also serve to normalize or control this anabolic, catabolic process taking place that can lead to normalizing extracellular matrix or to arrest or restore function within that disc. Lastly, you can provide functional cells. This would be the introduction of cells that produce extracellular matrix that can also have an impact on the host itself. And here you're generating normal extracellular matrix. So once again, two different pathways to potentially repair with the cell therapy. Um, discogenic cells, you'll hear us mention this term, is what we refer to our cell population. It's really unique to the other approaches out there. We'll use the term homologous. It's from the disc to treat the disc. So we start out with adult disc tissue as our source. It goes through a patented multi-step process to produce a therapeutic cell population that's cryo-frozen. Um, they're actually discogenic progenitor cells, and we'll talk about some of the footprint characteristics of these cells. They're not embryo-derived. They are purely allogeneic. They can go from patient A to patient B, um, and they serve as the platform technology within our devices. The application of these discogenic cells, how is that applied? Um, essentially, they're cryofrozen. We refer to it as IDCT for injectable discogenic cell therapy. Um, at point of care, which is outpatient, they'd be thawed. They're mixed in a syringe with a hyaluronic acid scaffold. And then the patient is put on a spine table 
um, just as if they were receiving a discogram procedure, which is a very common diagnostic procedure performed by an interventional spine specialist or pain specialist. Local anesthesia, the needle is placed under fluoro into the center of the disc, the syringe connected, and the dose injected. So it's a very simple procedure and one that does not prevent you from uh, secondary procedure down the road should it be warranted. And the thing about this type of cell therapy here is it doesn't burn bridges like a spine fusion does. So the whole goal here is to preempt this cascade at a point where you can positively impact this patient and save them from the cost, expense, and all the pain and, and anguish that can go with uh, fusion procedure, particularly if the results aren't favorable. Our goal is to really disrupt this treatment continuum. And I'm going to cite here a paper published in Spine Journal back in 2004 that specifically looked at ESI therapy or epidural steroid injection treatments here. And what was found in this paper that typically these patients would undergo two years of conservative therapy. So that would include physical therapy, over-the-counter meds, prescription meds, um, you name it, and then they would go through a course of ESI or three epidural steroid injections where it's shown that as you have the first epidural injection, they will have a decreasing effect. And while all these can treat pain and try to restore activity of the patient, they do not arrest or treat the degeneration going on within this disease state. So ultimately, and, and what was shocking here is that 54% of the patients undergoing ESI within one to two years went on to a spinal fusion procedure. So the goal here is to increase the quality of life, you know, regenerate the disc, and, and, and really, you know, be able to buy time or preempt this whole fusion procedure going down. So I'll touch on pathway costs here, and this was interesting. In the study, it found that treating this patient through this progression onto a single level fusion costs $115,000. So if we look at it, what we'd be able to preempt here is three months conservative care, moving on to a single injection of IDCT, is we could bring a cost of approximately $15,000. This would include the dose plus the cost of delivering the therapy. So once again, significant potential cost savings, and two would be to significantly improve the quality of life for these patients going through this disease. I'll touch on the cells. Um, these discogenic cells are a unique cell population. They have a specific fingerprint as characterized by a series of markers that really provide their identity. Um, they are stem-like and they're not tumorigenic. So key thing about this is that they still retain the stem cell properties. They're multipotent for the key lineages, for bone, fat, and cartilage. They're non-tumorigenic. We've confirmed this in multiple assays. Um, they are regenerative by producing extracellular matrix. So we touched earlier about these different mechanisms, action pathways, paracrine effects, extracellular matrix production. These cells, as they come out of the culture process, produce large quantities of the key two extracellular matrix components of nucleus propulsus, namely agrican and collagen too. So if you look at this confocal image here, um, you see the areas of expression or excretion of this matrix. And we've confirmed this through a series of staining methods also to confirm this uh, production of matrix. Um, the cells are also regenerative and form normalized disc. And I'm referring here to some of our animal data, na namely New Zealand white rabbits here. So if you start at the top, we start out on the left with H&E stains taken from our histology where you have at the top a healthy, untreated, uninjured disc. The second one is injured control where we would basically use a needle puncture established method within the literature to cause a defect let these animals level out for uh, two weeks, then we would inject and treat. The second one is um, injury control where you see a marked drop in disc height that occurred. The third image is HA treated, which we use as a control where there is no marked improvement in disc height or pathology from that. The last one is IDCT, where we're able to achieve not only increase in disc height, but a restoration of normal architecture. And we've confirmed through various other staining methods that this tissue is normal uh, within our pathology. Uh, the cells, not only are they regenerative, but they do restore disc height, and we believe that this may lead to a longer sustained improvement once we get into our human clinical trials. So here, once again, we would produce an injury at two weeks, and then starting at two weeks post-injury, we'd start to see an improvement in disc height. So if you look at the arrow on the yellow that's pointing to the red line, this is the IDC-treated uh, animals right with here, and you'd see getting back up to about 80 to 85 percent disc height. This sustained itself out to six months. We've done this in numerous rabbit studies. We've also mimicked this in the mini pig model, and irrespective of uh, different donor lots of cells, we've seen consistent results taking place, and we find that the cells do persist in the disc. 
uh, the cells are not immunogenic. You know, we've, we've looked at this. All of our studies in animals have utilized human cells. So this was a key thing that we use in a xenogenic model to show the uh, immunogenicity of these cells. And there's been no deaths, there's been no changes in animal behavior, all the hematology, clinical chem panels have all been uh, normalized, body weight normalized. A uh, key finding that our research staff did this year is one that confirmed that these cells are anti-inflammatory. So as we mentioned, they're multipotent, they have the classic mesenchymal lineage areas, but they're also anti-inflammatory. So, you know, we have this characteristic also to our cell populations. In summary, on the cells, uh, they're progenitor cells, they have those multipotent properties. They're differentiated cells that produce the matrix, in this case, the two key extracellular matrix components that make up the disc. Um, they're safe, there's no tumor formation, they're non-immunogenic, and extensive safety testing is part of the manufacture and release process. And I think the most important point here is that we're able to treat degeneration in multiple ways. One is regeneration of extracellular matrix. Two is the anti-inflammatory effect. I'll touch on progress we've made in the last year since we presented. Uh, regulatory clinical, we've completed our final pre-IND meeting. We've had numeral and formal meetings with the FDA. We're currently compiling our investigational new drug application, which we hope to submit by uh, mid-2015 next year, and also then to commence on enrollment in our first in human clinical trial. We've reviewed our trial design and gotten buy-in by the FDA, so we're anxious to uh, make that transition next year from preclinical into clinical stage. On the scientific and development front, our team's done an outstanding job. We've worked heavily in the past year on characterization, some of this information we've shared with you. We've done a lot of quality initial work on mechanism of action, and we've shown you some of the dual modes that we're uh, looking at right now. We'll work further to confirm that. Uh, extensive work on the device optimization and testing to support our IND and support our, our clinical device, and establishment of safety and efficacy in vivo. Um, a key area that our team is focused on is peer-reviewed abstracts and podium talks and presentations. We believe it's very imperative for us to establish our efficacy and information through publications and particularly at the key society meetings, and that's part of our charter. On regulatory and clinical, excuse me, on manufacturing quality, we currently have a CGMP compliant process that will support our pivotal as well as our clinical dose production. Um, we continue at this point now we have that out of the way is to start looking at um, what would be uh, the next scale-up technologies to build into our systems. We're very forward-looking um, on towards phase three, uh, even though we're just approaching the first phase. On IP, all of our IP is owned by the company. Our first issued patent took place last year in 2013 in the, in the U.S. and in Europe. And this has been a big year for us as far as the IP front. We received issuance in Japan, Israel, China, and most recently Australia this year. And we have two additional patents pending right now. Um, the key focus areas of the company are all gated towards our IND submission right now. So in the preclinical area, um, we're working to complete final characterization, get all the design control completed and ready within our IND application and our final animal studies. Regulatory and clinical, um, we're, we're doing extensive work right now, obviously, preparing our IND application, but then looking also um, at completing everything we need in our study so we can enroll as soon as we receive our IND clearance. Um, we're looking internationally at select market opportunities where uh, favorable legislation exists for clearance where we can do um, initial limited patient trials that could lead to early commercialization in these markets. Quality of manufacturing, as I touched on, uh, completing, um, you know, our, our CGMP uh, process for the IND submission, the write-up, and then focusing uh, forward looking at our manufacturing process. Our marketing work is really focused on understanding the patients, the treatment modalities, the caregivers, the interventionalists, and how they do business right now and how they treat, and then building up our reimbursement profile. We believe it's important to start on that right now at this point, so that way when we get further down the road, we have our data assembled in the proper manner to uh, procure reimbursement where it makes sense to do so. So in summary, uh, the company, uh, we have a focused team. We're focused 100 percent on uh, degenerative disc disease. We have extensive scientific evaluation with peer-reviewed publications. Um, we're focused on quality in our process to make sure we deliver an efficacious and viable dose, um, a very scalable process, a thousand of doses per single donor. And we have the opportunity here to help patients with few alternative therapeutic options. So 
Uh, appreciate his audience. I know it's getting close to lunch. And any questions? Um, we're not going to share that right now, um, but they're based on our uh, large animal study. So we, we did equivalency testing based on our large animal model, which is mini pigs and equivalency, and we've reviewed that initially with the FDA. Um, but due to our cells, they're spheroid cells versus single cells. We require a, a smaller number of cells than what some of the other companies' approaches may be. Right? Thanks again.